Thank you, Micah. That was wonderful. I should have paid you for that. <laughs> it's always good to be here with this, this church and to visit with you. Good morning. Good morning. Are you all awake? Okay, good. Yeah. There's a couple of reasons why we like coming here. One is because you're such friendly folks. The other is because half our family's here. <laughs> so we, we enjoy coming and being with you. Our text this morning is going to come out of uh, John, the 17th chapter, which this young man that's my pride here as my grandson who has given the announcement and so forth and read the scripture this morning and has taken my picture, I guess. I know. <laughs> anyway, we're, I wanted to come by. I asked Micah if we could come by and uh, mention uh, about our workshop and we had uh, Micah speak at our workshop last year. It was done at Lakeview, and it's one of the uh, workshops we've done over the years. But this time, we're going to have a big one. And we appreciate Micah. I appreciate him and the good work he and Disney are doing here uh, in this congregation. But we decided uh, in the area of the Puget Sound, we're not ex excluding, of course, eastern Washington. But some of us got together, and especially two elderships, the Puyallup Eldership and the Springbrook uh, Renton eldership got together and we decided and we've been around I've been around for I guess around here I don't know 35 years in this area and uh, uh, talked to the eldership at Springbrook and we just decided we need to do something we felt like the church is kind of flat in this area we felt like we've just we've just not had the fellowship we used to have I remember back in the 80s when we had Great Northwest Evangelism Workshop and the, the kind of fellowship we had the the wonderful unity that we experienced then, we kind of lost that. That was 20 years ago almost. And so uh, we just decided we're going to do something. What can we do? Think about it. That's two elderships met together. What can we do to kind of help build up the church and boost the church and help us get back into the Word more and help us get back into a unity to work together and support one another more? And we want that same spirit to, of course, spill over into eastern Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and as far as we can reach with that spirit. And so the two elderships decided we're going to do something about it. How about a workshop? And about a year and a half, we, went to, we got together and decided that. And so in that year and a half time, we finally came up with the Faith Builders Workshop. And I brought some brochures. I hope you take one of them. We've got some back there in the foyer. Uh, and uh, just get a chance. I know that Mike has mentioned it before, right? Uh, <laughs> to let you know about it. But we're excited about it. We have some great speakers coming like Brad Harrop and uh, Brother Thomas and Cedric Thomas. Uh, Truett Adair, Glenn Colley, and some other great speakers. And so it's going to be a three-day affair at Pacific Lutheran University, where we had GNU for so many years. And it's going to be the July 4th weekend as well. Uh, that wasn't my idea. We just got together, got some preachers together, and they all kind of decided, you know, we need to do something together. And we want to get back to the spirit of the GNU days. And so let's do it at PLU. Let's do it on the 4th of July weekend. We thought, okay, let's do it. It's been amazing to me. I've been down to Oregon speaking down there and doing a seminar down in the, <clears throat> the uh, Portland area, and they're all excited about it, talking to people from eastern Washington and Idaho to some degree are excited about it. So we're hoping that it'll bring us together because, you know, unity is so vitally important in the church. And that's what we're, we're gearing it for. We want to have a great workshop. We want to have the word preached and proclaimed and taught by men who are very good at it and faithful men in the word of God. But also we want to use it as a tool to bring us together. Because I believe that this prayer by Jesus in John the 17th chapter, which in reality is the Lord's Prayer, uh, is the prayer, I think, trying to bring forth the main mission, you might say, not only of saving souls, not only of sacrificing His body for the lost of the world, and because of the blood that he shed on the cross. But also to bring us together. Because if we're not together, we lose that essence. And that power that the cross represents. So read with me as we look at this text. Let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 17 in the Gospel of John. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who have given, you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. You know, Jesus prayed a lot. I mean, he prayed at his baptism. He prayed early on in his ministry. Before selecting his apostles, he spent the night in prayer. At his transfiguration, he prayed. And at his death, he prayed. He believed in prayer because he had a communication with God. He had a relationship with God, his Father. And this prayer perhaps brings it out more fully, maybe, than anything else he said during his ministry. The thing I want to make mention of is in verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's interesting that in that text, in the word know, comes from the Greek word gnosko. There are two basic Greek words that are used in the New Testament and are translated know. One is oida, which mainly has reference to the facts about. The other one is gnosko, which talks about an intimate relationship with. In fact, we find in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, it is said of Joseph that he did not know Mary until after Jesus had been born. That's gnosko. It even refers to a sexual intimacy. Paul will say over in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. I want to have that personal relationship with him. And Jesus is saying that's so vitally important here that I, in my prayer, pray to the Father that he might help those who follow me, those disciples, and later on those who hear the word of God from those disciples will have a personal relationship with Jesus. You're familiar, familiar with Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 22 or 23 and following, where Jesus said, Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, yet I'll say unto you, I never knew you. You've done miracles, you've done great things. Undoubtedly, they were disciples, believers, baptized believers. You've done some great things, but I never knew you. I never had that personal relationship with you. I didn't have that gnosko kind of relationship with you. Because maybe your motivation was more to build up your own glory. Your motivation was more to build up your own, you see, fact of being a leader. And enjoying the glory of having, <clears throat> having those uh, miraculous gifts. And you're doing it for your own purpose, your own image, and not for the cause of Jesus. So Jesus said, I want them to know you. And then in verse 11, he goes on to say, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, speaking of the disciples. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Then in verse 13, he said, I'm coming to, no, to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Isn't it amazing? He's talking about protecting them. Later on, we'll know it's not a protection from physical harm. All of the apostles, except John, we know historically, died a violent death. He's not praying to the Father, protect them from any physical harm, because they went through some very terrible times physically. Suffering, pain, and all of that. He's not praying that somehow God will protect them from physical harm. He's praying that somehow the Father will protect them from division. That's the basic essence of what he's saying. Because of the temptation of Satan. And he brings that point out in verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now the whole context of the, 12th, of the 17th chapter is talking about division. And he's bringing out the point that protect them from the evil one of tempting them to be divided. Because division will halt the progress of the gospel. Will halt the progress of the overall mission that I've given them. Nothing destroys that mission like division. And what's interesting, later on they'll have the final last supper. And during that last supper, the twelve will argue about who's the greatest. That's not the first time they did that. Some, claim, some scholars claim they did it three times in Jesus' <clears throat> ministry. But here we are, the last supper. He's about to be betrayed by Judas and he's going to die on the cross. And they're arguing about who's the greatest. Because Jesus knew that that kind of division would halt.